Hello, my name is uh, Brother Tim Carter, a pastor of Landmark Missionary Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Arkansas, particularly the one that gathers at 2200 Marshall Road. And before we begin, I'd just like to address, does someone have to believe in limited or unlimited atonement? Someone have to believe in total hereditary depravity or which converts into total inability or partial ability, uh, unconditional election, conditional election, limited, uh, resistible, irresistible grace, um, perseverance or preservation. Uh, but before I do, I'd just like to read a, a excerpt from the minutes from February 15th, 1950. This is uh, Pastor Appreciation Month, but I'm using it for uh, Church Appreciation Month because a great professor at the Missionary Baptist Seminary, which I'm sporting my Missionary Baptist Seminary t-shirt, and it's really not warm enough outside for it, but inside. Dr. Terry Parrish gave me this. I really like giving a shout out to Dr. Terry Parrish because then he can uh, bear the uh, fame or reproach of having been acknowledged by me. But uh, Dr. L.D. Foreman, <clears throat> he was a moderator, and it says there were 10 people stated that they were ready to go into the organization. Now this is from an actual notebook. You, you won't be able to see it, but it's, it's typed, you know, when a typewriter actually existed. And it said the group voted to accept the Articles of Agreement. That was from Pendleton's church manual resolution and church covenant and they said they coveted together to work for the advancement of the cause of Christ. Um, it says that there was someone there named Brother Dale Capel. I never knew a Dale Capel, but if that's L D Capel and the D stands for Dale, that would be interesting. A uh, brother Ford was there. Um, Walter Brannon, Brother Walter Brannon of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, which that church house is located uh, right across the street from where my uh, personal home is. And it says there were 15 preachers there. Cheryl Ford, R. Ford, Alan Capel, Arden Johnson. Well, anyway, um, it's just remarkable that uh, Dr. L.D. Foreman had that much to do with our church. In our libraries, this book, if you can't see it, it's because the light's so bright there we go, but it's it's called uh, Bible in Eight Ages. Well, I wish you could see that. There we go, Bible in Eight Ages. If I could take the direct light off, maybe that would help. Maybe I could do that, and, but it won't work. Never mind. I don't know technology well enough yet. My kids laugh when they see the videos. I'm saying, well, people need the information. But anyway, it's a book that it's actually Eight Ages. He broke the book down into dispensations. Um, in it, he has a, a theory, a gap theory, and he defines the word theory from the language. Of course, <clears throat> there's more than one gap theory, but uh, I certainly have no reason to criticize his theory. The only fact um, that I'm aware of that's infallible in the premise upon which he based it was that the earth came to be um, empty and uninhabited or unformed now there is a third way, and I've communicated that before, but it's really not worth the climb. The view's not worth the climb, and it's called the Koine Old Testament, the Septuagint, where the Greek influence is very self-evident. And they have a whole different interpretation, and they don't seem to have the problem with um, an earth always being formless or uninhabited or unfilled. Um, but that's another story. It, but before you say, well, I'd have to rewrite the whole Bible, I'd rather pick was or become. Well, okay, uh, I, that is easier. Uh, but now become has been determined based upon strong uh, correlation between the Koine Greek New Testament, which was inspired. But that's enough about that. Uh, you can spend all your time working on be or become, or you can just determine it's become as the text does, and then begin to evaluate the different gap theories. 
uh, for example, the most recent one was produced by Dr. John Penn. But this is about, do you have to pick total, resistible, irresistible, unconditional, things like that? And then here's a, <clears throat> a book, you, you can't see it, but I'll work on this lighting problem. But it's a, called The Church That Jesus Built. And Dr. L.D. Foreman, he was author of the Bible in Eight Ages, was perhaps the most respected scholar among his contemporaries. Again, he was, oversaw the organization service of Landmark Missionary Baptist Church February 15, 1950. Uh, we have a long history being so close to the seminary, this close, that is, in just uh, miles away. But it says that uh, for 32 years he was associated with the Missionary Baptist Seminary in Little Rock, Arkansas. 20 of those years were spent as president of the school. And then it goes on to explain publications and things he's done. A uh, very uh, remarkable missionary uh, Baptist man. But in his book, The Church That Jesus Built, which all these are part of the library at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, so it was, it was striking to me to go into a congregation and find out that textbooks that they used and had were actually written by the people that were instrumental in forming what we know that church to be. But he writes uh, quite a bit here, which was very challenging. He taught something my father taught, and he said students must advance beyond their teachers, otherwise there would be no progress. It isn't unreasonable to expect the student to amplify, enlarge, or build and add to the basic principles he receives from his teacher. Uh, however, there are certain checks and balances, and that's true, he says, of every field of science, philosophy, and learning and of course theology is no exception. Uh, my father always said that he would lament if we his sons did not go further since we began on his shoulders if you will and he expected us to go forward so uh, my dad was really emphatic about pursuing education uh, opportunities to go to college that he didn't have he insisted thus his grandsons over whom I was responsible to assure that his priorities that he instilled in me, uh, neither of them wanted to go to college. And I said, well, that's fine as long as you don't miss class. And both have finished college multiple times now. And both are very uh, excellent in their education. They both are ordained by Landmark Missionary Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Arkansas. And they're very uh, engaged in their lives. And they've given me beautiful grandbabies, for example. Uh, but back to this, um, seemingly endless um, frictive battle that always has these frictive elements in it. I think it comes down to something that it will almost bother people because it's so embarrassing, but in um, an evaluation of uh, things that people say or in fields of science or education in whatever you're evaluating, uh, there's two characteristics that are chief among things we evaluate. Things that can be quantified and things that can be qualified. For example, there's a very um, caustic young man out on the internet and he's just, you know, <laughs> carpet bombing the whole world saying that Jesus died for the church and he didn't die for anyone else. He says things like Jesus laid down his life for his sheep and no one else and he was trying to build a case for limited when he was missing the purpose for example in John 10 where Jesus speaks of himself as the good shepherd in the common expression more words are there and and really give a strong um, message in that gospel account uh, that he's uniquely qualified that he doesn't have to outsource his sheep and that was written in order that someone might cause themselves deliberately to trust that Jesus is the Messiah. So rejecting limited atonement isn't really um, consequential. And rejecting unlimited is inconsequential as well. What is consequential, what is uh, rejection of the gospel, is to reject Jesus, who is the Good Shepherd, qualified as the one who laid down his life for his sheep. So if you say, well, I reject Jesus, Okay, then you're rejecting the shepherd, the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. And you say, well, I reject Jesus. 
uh, then you're rejecting the head of the church that gave up his life and offered himself. You say, well, I reject Jesus. Um, well, then you're rejecting the high priest who gave himself once for all. Uh, if you say, well, I reject limited atonement or unlimited atonement. I know, but do you have a pleader, an advocate with the Father? If you reject him as your advocate, you have no one to plead your case. So what can be lost in all of this is somehow because people quantified it, and it's our nature to do that. I wouldn't want to uh, say that we were, well, I don't think the, the people that started all this were smart enough uh, to calculate the adverse effects of quantifying something that was only qualified in the scriptures. Uh, the scriptures are there to glorify God. So total hereditary depravity, you have to then ask someone to qualify that statement. And then you find out that everyone believes that man is depraved. Now, not everyone even knows the word for depravity, um, which is very interesting. Similar to the word free will, you'll hear a lot of argumentation. And there is no consequence for rejecting free will any more than there's an advantage for asserting it. And that's what's very disappointing to people because unless we have meaning of our words that come from the Bible, uh, people can become so divided which is really actually the original condition. And it seems that people seek categorical terms, um, points to justify what already exists in, in and among humanity. Um, so what happens if you reject prevenient grace or common grace, or you pick from resistible or you pick from irresistible? Well, really, uh, the grace from God, according to the Bible, is the person Jesus. Uh, the story of the Good Shepherd was in, had the purpose was already defined. A young man was very upset, emotively expressing himself that to me that I had to fall into one camp or another, even going so far as saying that he uses limited or unlimited, and he asked a question for whom Jesus died, as though it's about quantifying the people rather than qualifying thus glorifying the one who died and he said he used it to sort out and to know what kind of people meaning which camp you're in <clears throat> so I told him as I would say now the death of Jesus was not for a purpose that we can use quote it as a source of filtering out and categorizing people that is not in the scriptures. The purpose of Jesus' death according to the scriptures is in order that we see in him who came to get to die for the sins of his people. He said, well, there it is. I quantified it right there. The sins of his people, his people, 196,243 people. No, that's quantified. And it's qualified according to the Bible. And when it's understood in the reality of that's how he his death was qualified, then you notice that's his, that's an attribution. That's how we tribute him and recognize him as the Messiah. So if you reject the Messiah, then you're rejecting the Messiah, the true Messiah who gave his life for the sins of his people. If you reject Jesus, you're rejecting the good shepherd who laid down his life for his own sheep. Uh, there's really not a gospel there. There's no good news if the shepherd came and sided with the wolves. But what's happened is it's really hard to sustain, I'll just be quite frank, it's impossible to sustain interest from people when there isn't some type of frictive element involved. So I find it very, um, well, thought-provoking when I'm witnessing to people, especially when we go out and do a Cornet campaign or a crusade or and we highlight the website and direct people there. I'm really struck that it doesn't occur to them that if we're going, we, if one intends to make the death of Jesus about the people rather than the Messiah, the person being uh, offered, the one who loved enough to come to this earth to fulfill the law, that we weren't even concerned to fulfill it. Um, that is, Jesus fulfilled the law with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind, all of his body, and all of his strength. And I've broken every 613 law codes 
uh, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my body and all my strength, according to the Bible, I am culpable for all of those laws according to all of those realities and uh, uh, areas in which I could uh, be guilty or found guilty. And God pronounced me guilty. So, But Jesus came and exclusively did that. Now, <clears throat> we don't really have anything to interest people when we go out to make disciples if they're not interested in which Messiah gave his life for the sins of his people. It's not how many are those people. It's not, that's quantifying. That, that creates a rub and a friction that cannot be, it's actually something that can't be reconciled. It's similar to open or closed theism. Someone says, well, are you open or closed theist? I said, no, I teach living theism. Well, are you pre or post trib? I say, no, I teach that the return of Christ, at the return of Christ, the dead elect in Christ will be raised first and foremost. Then the living ones, the ones, uh, we ourselves, the living ones, the ones remaining around will be simultaneously seized away together with them. And they say, well, what about millennial? Well, the tribulation and the great tribulation are two different things, so they're quite distinct. But it seems there's... Uh, an irony that, that people seem to think they've done their work to interpret the Bible when all they've done is sustain a contradiction which the Bible doesn't contradict itself. And then they go out and agitate and incite the very, I guess, incitable uh, emotions. Uh, the Bible speaks of the motions of sin. Uh, I would like to describe them as the emotions of our um, flesh and whatever's in us as fallen people and then it speaks of a faith that is being energized by love so faith gives us energy I mean love gives us energy to be faithful to the Bible to what it teaches and it seems we have plenty of emotions to negatively observe so when you listen to people if you believe the Christians for example who have bought into quantifying rather than qualifying. On one hand, I want to tell you that the God, let's say, of the Arminians or Arminianism is unworshipful. And on the other hand, people who claim to be Christians will say the God of, let's say, Calvinism or what they would call hyper, whatever that is, um, they say he's a monster and he just didn't love enough and didn't do enough and should have done more and but if you listen to both of them, you wouldn't want anything to do with, first, the God that both of them indict, and secondly, you wouldn't want anything to do with the people that are claiming in both camps to be God's people because it seems they have more energy to denounce the other because living theism, unless you teach that, it won't even be heard in the discussion. Unless you teach, uh, for example, uh, a lot of argumentation goes on today between where is the relationship of the new birth to faith? And even in the statement, the question, where is the relationship of the new birth to faith? People don't notice faith as a punctuator, simple form of action. And yet in the Bible, it has, the gospel is written for the purpose that those who hear it or read it would deliberately cause themselves, and that comes out of the causative stem of Hebrew, Genesis 15, 6, Abraham or Abram at the time, caused himself to believe, deliberated, comes out of the additional understanding disposed in the subjunctive uh, language there used. And I really don't know what to say except if the gospel says it was written in order that a person might deliberately cause him or herself to believe, punctual, simple action. There it is even in the common King James English Bible. And then in 1 John 5, 1, it says that everyone who is believing, that's a gerundive uh, noun or a verbal substantive, whichever way you enjoy understanding the reality of that language. It says the people that are deliberately causing themselves to keep on believing. It's a very highly inflected, wordy language. Well, there it says that the new birth occurs and then the person, every person, and that would be the person having previously been fathered and continues to be fathered out from God. Well, what does that person look like? Well, they're always 
and are continually and deliberately causing themselves to be believing that Jesus is the Christ. And you can ask people. I've, I've talked with um, great Bible students and teachers and uh, they've run into people who wonder if they quote lost their salvation. They say, well, are you still believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah who died for the sins of his people? Is he still the good shepherd that laid down his life for his sheep? Is he the high priest that offered himself once for all? Is he the head of the church that laid him, gave himself both an offering and a sacrifice? And they're like, well, yes. I said, okay. So <laughs> it's strange that that when we make it about ourselves, I will never, I could never know if I am saved to the satisfaction of my own uh, introspective, whatever that is. But now, if you want to ask me about my Savior, I'm so certain about Him and what He accomplished in my place and the law that He fulfilled and the offering of Himself once for all as my great high priest and as the one who laid down His life for me, one of His sheep. Um, it's really unusual uh, that people have created this well, not unusual. We understand it everywhere in the world. People quantify something. Uh, but when you quantify it and you don't qualify it, you create a friction that's by design impossible to reconcile. So I don't assert or teach common grace. I don't assert, neither do I teach prevenient grace. I do not teach irresistible grace. I do not teach resistible grace. I do not teach limited atonement. I do not teach unlimited atonement. Now, I could go on this way so long that it would be exhausting for people, but at the end, uh, instead of just saying what I don't teach, I, as I was expected to do, can take a person through the Bible, the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, remove these contradictions, demonstrate that the Bible doesn't contradict itself, take away the subsequent or consequential flummoxes and then free the person to go out and enjoy their Bible and as I did when I would read it before these uh, constructed or designed uh, irreconciled or irreconcilable conflicts and contradictions were introduced to me and I still will ask people today if you say the Bible doesn't contradict itself why are you picking sides in a contradiction knowing that by doing so you're sustaining the very contradiction you're saying exists in the Bible that you once said the Bible doesn't contradict itself. So if you're in a flummox, study more of what's written and know the difference between what's written and what's said, talk or text. Uh, but it really comes down to people are quantifying something. And that's plenty. I've gone way too long to make this even worth watching. But if you have nothing to do one day and, and you say, hey, I'll just turn on this video. But no, you do not have to believe in limited or unlimited atonement. You have to come to the point where you would prefer to know the significance of the advocate, the pleader, uh, and that you would even know what that word means. You'd have to come to the point where you'd appreciate the purpose of the narrative that speaks of Jesus laying down his life for his sheep. You have to come to where you take the Word of God so seriously that all of these things that have come along less than or other than the Scriptures really don't captivate you. Uh, and that way you can lead others out who have been held captive by it. So that's enough. Uh, have a good day.